Thank you, Sean. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, and I really am delighted to welcome everyone this morning to the September NSA uh, Breakfast Club. Uh, a very warm welcome to our panel this morning. I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing from, uh, from them all from a very wide range of perspectives to talk about what sheep farmers are doing and in some cases what more they might do to aid nature recovery on, uh, on farms. Um, we've got some two months to go now before COP26 talks start to take place in, in Glasgow. Um, there and in most other sustainability forums, um, climate change is at the top of the agenda. But following not far behind is nature recovery. And obviously closely related to that is the protection of natural resources, water, air and soil. So today the NSA is starting our countdown to COP26 and over the next two months leading up uh, to that event and most likely for a month or two afterwards as well we're going to be busy stepping up our communications to make the case for the sustainability of British sheep farming and also in some cases to challenge our industry to do more to position itself in a positive place um, as a solution uh, to some of the challenges that we face rather than being the problem. So today's webinar is all about nature recovery um, and the sheep farmed environment. Um, Nature and biodiversity um, and ecosystems generally have become a really complex subject. Um, it wasn't so when I started my time on this planet. Um, if I'm right thinking back, and sometimes there's a risk that you're not always as accurate as you might be, but if I'm right thinking back then, nature was very much by accident. Uh, the people I spent my childhood around didn't go out of their way to manage it for wildlife. Um, it was there living alongside what farmers, growers, river keepers, game keepers were doing. But the countryside, if, again, if I remember correctly, the countryside at that time seemed to be buzzing. You know, it was buzzing with insects. I remember coming back home after a drive through the countryside and the following morning going out and looking at the front of the car and being quite fascinated by a whole array of different insects and flies and, and, and beetles all squashed on the front of the car. You know, you rarely get that these days. Um, it was buzzing with birds. It was buzzing with um, small mammals and with plant life as well. Um, sometimes thinking back, you know, it's difficult to think about whether this was just a, a remnant, a leftover from previous decades, or was nature truly living in harmony with the way we were managing our land? What I do know is that um, the farmland was less tidy then than it is now. And I also know that throughout my entire farming career, um, myself and many, many people like me have been encouraged to make farms tidier. And, um, and I guess that's... Um, in the environment around our farms, but also in the way that we farm our land as well. And maybe, just maybe, we need to um, think about a new understanding of what tidy really means and in terms of what um, tidy is really delivering on our farms. So we've got three really great speakers here today. I'm really pleased to welcome uh, John Palsy, Howell Morgan and Davy McCracken. Each of them are going to give us um, 10 minutes or so um, and then we'll open for questions and, and discussion. So, um, John, uh, if I can pass over to you, please. Right, thank you very much, Phil. I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, That's, um, it's just coming up. Okay, so is that all ready to go? Um, it just, uh, it's not, full. that's it, that's perfect, John, well done. Right, good. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Phil. I'm just gonna look at my watch to check my beginning of my 10 minutes, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our reintroduction of, uh, to sheep in, 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 to our farm uh, in 2014, but also um, the benefits of lays that we've had on our farms you know, over the last 20 years. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, we've got just under 1,500 acres of organic cropping on the farm, and, that, and that's a you know, rotation with lays. So we had a rotation obviously before we were organic, but it didn't include lays in it. And this is really the sort of nub of, I think what we're delivering as far as um, uh, biodiversity and nature recovery is concerned uh, by the inclusion of those lays. We've got a thousand uh, breeding ewes. Uh, we've got three um, arable staff on the arable side of the, of the business and our sheep uh, labourers all contracted out to Robert Spink, uh, who looks after our sheep for us with, um, with two others. Uh, we started our organic conversion, as I said, in 1999, and that was for economic reasons uh, mainly, but also uh, worries about what was happening to our soils and also wildlife on the farm. Um, but it doesn't have to be organic. And my, my, my feeling is that, you know, lays and having a, an animal on the farm uh, it, it has huge benefits for soils and for wildlife. And that's what I'm hoping I'm going to sort of expand on later on. And uh, we've got a, a six-year rotation on the farm here, which includes a two-year lay, 
uh, followed by winter, alternate winter and spring cereals with a pulse in there in the middle to build a little bit of fer fertility. So, um, yeah, why livestock? Well, um, it's a bit of a blurry picture here, um, but these are some of our New Zealand Romneys on a black grass trial to see, um, you know, uh, what grazing animals do to uh, black grass numbers. Um, but really, we, we, we really wanted to extend our rotation, which is why we brought livestock in to extend our rotation by another year to have another year of, of, of a lay because we could see the benefits that lays were bringing in to our rotation. And that was really around, you know, fertility and soil health, you know, another year and a really good lay, uh, especially legumes lay, had a huge benefit as far as soil health was concerned. But it also gave us another year to deal with weeds that were building up on the farm uh, since being organic over that sort of first 15 years. But also, even though we were increasing biodiversity on the farm, we felt that lays also had a huge amount to offer to increase uh, that biodiversity. Um, also having livestock on the farm really helped us sort of fill in that nutrition gap. I mean, putting a lays through an animal rather than, and I put down here, reduced mowing, rather than just mowing and cutting and mulching, um, is a much better uh, way of dealing with uh, recycling those nutrients in, in my mind. Um, and also the other thing is that we sell quite a lot of uh, crops into the human food chain and we have to clean them and we've now got something that we can do with our crop screenings which is to feed them to the sheep when they need that over the winter occasionally. But also it brings in a huge amount of not only natural diversity to our, our business but also a financial diversity to our business as well. And so we, we went for uh, sheep and New Zealand Romneys really uh, for, for these reasons, really, uh, that, you know, low capital costs of bringing a, 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 an animal into the farm, minimal infrastructure, everything's on um, uh, electric fencing and uh, movable bowsers, which go around the rotation. Uh, we wanted something that was going to be outside on our, we got 35% clay on our soils, and we, but we wanted something to be outside all year round so we didn't have to put up a, a shed. Uh, i.e. you know again a low capital cost entry into livestock farming uh, we wanted uh, an easy care breed uh, we wanted to definitely out lamb outdoors which we do and all the other things that you really want from uh, an animal to, to, to have a sort of a hands-off easy care sort of approach good feet resistant to worms and also the ability to use uh, the sheep within our uh, arable rotation as well by grazing some of our more forward uh, especially our winter crops um, so, so first of all, we, we, I think, you know, we can't talk about uh, regenerating nature um, uh, purely by looking at what's happening above the ground. We also have to understand what's happening uh, within our soils and, you know, uh, bringing lays back into the system uh, has hugely um, contributed to, first of all, building up uh, soil organic matter. As you can see, we started in 1999 at 2.9%. And over the last 20 years, we've built it, we've doubled it to, um, you know, 5.5%. And uh, if you just have a very quick look at this um, uh, chart on one side of my slide, is that you can see um, we've taken four, we, we test four fields every year to see how things are changing. And you can see in the uh, the organic matter, the loss of OMLOI um, uh, thing there, you can see that, you know, on the second year lay, you know, you are, you know, constantly building up this fantastic root, root mass of organic matter. And also the soil health index in this thing is the top mark you can get is five. And you can see that when you get a lay into the system, you're building up to that sort of five. So, you know, there's proof in, the, in, in those tests to show that, you know, lays are a massive contributor to the uh, health of our soils. But also they also con contribute 92.8% uh, of our carbon sequestration um, in our soils, uh, which is a massive amount. Uh, and so something that just cannot be uh, ignored. And, and, and these are showing, um, you know, the health of our soils as far as the CO2 burst test is concerned. And even if you see at the end of our rotation, which is the bottom graph, uh, we are still uh, competing with the two other people we compared with, one a plow based system and one a mint till system, is we're still competing well as far as um, uh, soil health is concerned. Uh, and far outstripping it uh, right at the lay stage of the rotation, which is the top uh, chart you can see there. So that's about soils, um, but what about nature? Um, we do a huge amount of surveys on the farm. We do a survey for pretty much everything, to be quite honest, to keep on top of what we are regenerating as far as nature is concerned. 
Um, uh, but I've really picked out the three ones that I feel are really sort of hugely influenced by Lay's. And the first one is birds. And looking down at the bottom of these bullet points, the undersown stubble situation on an arable farm uh, bringing in livestock is, is just a big win-win as far as I'm concerned. Because first of all, you've got your stubbles there, you undersow them, you know, as the crop is growing, then you harvest those uh, crops. And then suddenly you've just got this massive amount of overwintered stubbles with, with all this food in, which is, is so important to our birds. And then, of course, you've got the undersowed lay and we, we sow uh, very uh, you know, heavy leguminous sort of lays. So first of all, you've got birds coming in there. And, and then, of course, you've got insects coming in uh, uh, to those leguminous flowers as well. So there's just got a multi-species benefit as far as undersown lays are concerned. They add a massive amount as far as I'm concerned to certainly to birds and if you look at uh, the, the figures here the red list species uh, this is compare us comparing ourselves to a next door farm uh, that we took on farming organically um, and if you look over the last 20 years we look at our red list species we've got the numbers there are 579 compared to 24 on the other farm 33 amber list compared to one and uh, birds of conservation concern 612 on our farm and 25 on the other. I mean, there you go. And that's why I, I put that mainly down to having these under so lays. And this is what we're presented with at the end of harvest. The, the, you know, the combine comes along there, you've got all those stubbles. And this is before the clover gets going across the rows. Uh, in year two, that's just a, a you know massive green clover field. And, you know, uh, you can just see um, you know, the impact that that's going to have on sort of uh, a farm and a sort of clayland farm and lowland stuff, very few animals. And suddenly you've got all these hundreds of acres on our farm with this food source for pollinators and for birds. The other thing is a huge increase as far as we're concerned, as far as butterflies are concerned. And a lot of that is down to, if you look at all these species here, a lot of these species uh, really major on things like I know I've, you've got you've got one on a bit of knapweed there, but they um, love birds foot trefoil. Birds foot trefoil in uh, our, we always put them on legumes mixes because it just covers a huge amount of the butterflies uh, that we're trying to re-attract to our farm. And that that's you know down to having more lays on the farm as well and having sheep back on the farm. Uh, and the other, the, the, the last really important thing, and I've talked about pollinators, but, you know, um, bees and wasps. I mean, you know, just having that massive nectar source all the way through the season in those grazing lays as the sheep are rotated around them uh, is, is absolutely crucial for making sure that we not only uh, have more different, a greater number of bee species on the farm, but greater numbers within those greater number of species as well. And I've, I've, I've flagged up the fringeless nomad bee here because it was the first uh, one that had been found in Suffolk ever. Now, I'm not saying that we've got the only one in Suffolk or the only population in Suffolk, but if you start doing these surveys on your farm, you might have them as well. Uh, that's why it's incredibly important to do uh, surveys, especially with elms coming around the corner. Uh, we need to know what we've got, where we're going, and what we have to do to improve um, the situation. Um, and, and we're talking about, you know, is Shabby the new chic? I mean, we, we have lots of different options as far as our environmental stewardship is concerned. Um, and, and the picture to the top right is, uh, is an example of one of our field corners. Uh, but you can see a huge amount of diversity in there. And the, the bottom, the large picture and the bottom uh, right-hand picture, they are just from margins. There's a bee orchid just in a margin that we haven't cut. And if you look at the amount of knapweed, and uh, the vetches uh, coming up in the, uh, the margins just next to that hedge in the main picture. Uh, you know, it takes a few years to build this up and you've just got to start cutting now and these things will regenerate themselves. So, you know, keeping your farm, um, uh, uh, you know, diverse as far as your margins are concerned is, is um, uh, very important. I think it's, hard, it's not shabby at all. It's absolutely wonderful. So, so that's really my, my uh, sort of contribution. I mean, you can see this picture of these sheep going to these lambs, going to this red clover. Also the top right-hand picture, you know, using them to uh, graze um, cover crops over the winter. Uh, absolutely fantastic. That must is still flowering, still producing food for pollinators. And, and the bottom is sort of a, uh, a sort of a white clover lay on the bottom. But, you know, rotational clover rich, understone lays, healthier soils, more nature and top quality land. I mean, it is a win-win-win situation. 
So um, thank you and buy some of our land. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, John. There's a few questions that have come in, but we'll store them up until um, the, we finish the presentations. It does seem to me that you've really had a focus on productive farming, but also optimising the, the other multifunctional things that come out of farming, you know, nature and, uh, and, and, and soil carbon and the like. So that was really um, inspirational. Thank you. How can we pass over to you? Yeah, good morning, um, Phil um, and everyone. Just trying to get us going. Bear with me. Right. Hi, yeah, I'm Howell Morgan. I farm in Eskersife near Mudvina, Breck and Beacons. Um, it's a predominantly upland and hill farm. So we've got um, grazing for um, sheep on um, the adjoining common and cattle and horses. Um, so basically, um, up until 2019, I was a big believer in food and feed and everything you can buy from the local merchants. But then, you know, I wasn't making much money, hardly any profit. So we, we decreased the sheep numbers a bit, increased the cattle numbers a bit, basically, so we can um, um, have farmyard manure, as my new fertilizer, because I didn't want to use any fertilizer. And um, so, um, yeah, try and cut out imports in it. So basically, today's subject is, is shabby new cheek. Um, do we really need the name for what we're doing? Like farming, conventional, organic, regenerative, grass-fed, natural-friendly, carbon farming, biodiversity, ecosystem building, holistic management. I think the only thing as a livestock farmer, especially sheep farmers should be doing is working with nature, not against it. So on the farm, we uh, predominantly um, sell um, breeding ewes at the premium, uh, breeding ewe lambs at the pre premium, which uh, gives us a bit of cushion, which is great stuff. Um, we tend to use a lot of clovers in um, mixes. We've received that quite a bit over the last few years. I'm trying to move away from that. Um, my store lambs, finished lambs, hog at mutton, um, market locally. Uh, tend to sell store lambs if a grass growth is poor, um, especially, you know, uh, in the hot dry summers. Um, we finish lambs through either a collection center or markets. And um, I also sell um, direct selling. So I sell quite a bit of, um, beef, um, lamb, hogget and mutton to um, markets, uh, farmers markets. Um, connecting with our consumers is more important than ever. I, I learn a lot from these markets and what people want, what, what they want from us farmers. And I think as something we have missed the trick somehow. So a lot of them are telling me to know how high do you grow your hedge? And so all of a sudden I started growing my hedges a lot higher. So these hedges are probably being cut every three years. I just trim the size, trim the tops as high as the hedge contractor can reach. It's not just to uh, give shelter from wind and rain and sunshine, but wildlife habitat too. I'm a big believer if you've got nature working for you and plenty of bee, birds, bees, etc. around your farm, your farm is actually working. So we Taken part in a Glastier uh, Advanced agri environment Scheme on a farm. We're in our sixth year with it. We've done a lot of fencing, a lot of tree planting, um, shelter belts. Um, so here I've used organ, uh, oak posts, um, fenced off rather than the two metre required. I've done about four, five, six metres, given a bit of shelter. And um, it seems to work for us because we're quite an open, exposed upland farm so the shelter is important all through the year. Herbal lays I've used quite a bit in the last three four years I think they're fantastic they're great feed for animal deep rooting for controlling water runoff. which going forward I think we have to um, as farmers especially upland farms look after the water runoff on our farms to prevent flooding downstream. 
So these herbal lays, you know, there's a variety of them. You know, I've used up to 19 varieties of herbs and uh, clovers. Chicory and plantain and clovers seem to do the best. Um, some of them possibly fairly acidic up here. They struggle a bit, but um, yeah, the plantain and clovers tend to last three, four years. So I use clover quite a bit now. And this field on the left, um, amazing crop of clover. It's just a normal seed mix I've uh, bought uh, and put in uh, four years ago. Um, for some reason, at the moment, it's a fantastic uh, crop of clover. I'm not sure what else I got, but the lambs are doing thriving on it and doing well. So now clover is my farmyard and farmyard manure is my source of NPK. And also lime inputs have been reduced by um, not using chemical fertilizers, because we all know they are acidic and they lower the pH. So the fields are we, um, put into a Glaster Advance um, six years ago initially as low imports or no imports rather and reversion. The pH have risen um, quite a bit um, without any inputs, not even farmyard manure. So um, it's quite interesting. You cut out the fertilizer, you know, your, your NP and Ks will balance out and your uh, pH will rise. Uh, livestock grazing is important in it, and you have to have the livestock, uh, especially the cattle, don't know they make a hell of a difference, uh, but sheep has got a big role to play. I've uh, wintered um, sheep on Swedes for six, seven years. Um, as you can see from these pictures, um, it's quite, um, it depends on the weather condition, don't know, field condition, so this field, a bit on a wet side, probably not the best choice of field, but we're trying to do a rotation over, um, over the last six years, so we don't go back to the same field. But I am starting to question, is um, seeds, are Swedes actually the answer? Um, it's a bit of soil disturbance, which I'm not a big fan of. I have those um, round up um, last year, um, was the last time we was round up to um, get the seed established. Um, so I'm trying to move away. So this year I'm doing some conserved grazing and bale grazing. And the picture on the left is um, last year's picture, which I grazed it with cattle. Fantastic. I'm going to, it's the third year I'll be doing it this year. And uh, I think it's a fantastic way of outwintering cattle. Um, to min minimize your winter time in the sheds with the cattle. So I can keep cattle out on um, 20 odd acres of ground with um, conserved grazing and bales placed uh, in the right place and we just roll them out as and when needed. So the picture on the left is just something I haven't really tried before. Um, big bale silage and uh, hopefully um, there will nothing being grazing this now. Um, I got a bunch of lambs that are taking the clover back at the minute. Once um, they're just taking it back, uh, there'll be nothing grazing up till January, February. And hopefully the bales will keep the sheep for a couple of months. Going forward, I'm looking for uh, an arable farm to uh, winter my sheep on, um, on cover crops. Um, so as John said, um, I think these arable farms really need our sheep just to put the manure in and trample these cover, cover crops down. So these, these um, fertilizer and feeds, um, do we really need to use so much of these? At what price do they come unprofitable? Who actually makes the money from these? As sheep farmers, can we farm without them? Should we reduce the amount we use? I, I think um, as a, that, that, that actually that already is part of my day job um, occasionally, so I might be shooting myself in the foot, but um, you know, um, there's time and place for feed, which is great. Um, but I do question the fertilizer. Um, does it over a 12 month period, do we actually gain enough to justify the cost? Um, I've done some trials on my farm just in, um, in previous years just doing half the fields with fertilizer and half without. I didn't, over a 12 month period, I didn't see no benefit at all. So we have to question, and especially upland sheep farmers, 
I think we need to reduce or maybe move away from these inputs. Um, big question at the moment in the uplands in Wales, especially where I am, biodiversity and food or forest, what do we want from our farms and our landscapes? I think we, there's room for both. As you can see in the picture on the left, I got a herbalaise and a fat in a bunch of lambs. Um, we've got plenty of trees in the background. 15% of my farm is covered in trees, um, plus a thousand meters of tree planting. I do in um, hedge, hedge row restoration every year in the Glasgow Advance. Um, but governments seem to be putting all the money towards tree planting at the moment in our part of the world, which I'm a bit wary of. So what do we have due to how, how we farm currently? We've had a uh, lot more hares the last couple of years. Uh, curlews, I've got six hen curlews nesting on my hill. Skylarks would probably be about thousands there. Meadow pipit, loads of them. Golden plovers come back every so often. We've got orchids, wax cat mushrooms, variety of butterflies, huge carbon storage, creating lots of wildlife habitat. We're rebuilding biodiversity, reducing rainwater runoff, et cetera, et cetera. And all this is still producing good quality beef and lamb. So this, this is just a couple of pictures of benefits of managed livestock raising. Orchids growing fantastically. We let the orchids grow um, and you know, until they're about to die off before we turn the cattle in. I can't remember the name of this beetle. I think it's something like this three spotted beetle or something. Uh, cattle was actually grazing there and sheep at, at the time I took that picture. We got wax cut, cut mushrooms found in the uplands of a Brecon Beacons, thanks to sheep raising. Um, I didn't really know what they were until a couple of years ago. And um, uh, somebody working from Natural England said they're very rare and they're only found in this part of the world and it's all down to sheep raising. These are the pictures of our golden plovers. Just quite lucky to get a good picture of them. Um, yeah, really, you know, I think it was about 45, I counted quickly there, something fantastic. So it's not a very good picture. We've got curlews on the left picture. Two curlews just took off. Anybody can take a picture of a curlew. I can, you know, take my hat off them. And the other one is even worse picture. It's a, a rare red, a white red kite. So um, I see it quite often around the farm, which is really exciting. As sheep farmers, I think um, it can be quite a mundane job at times, but seeing something like curlews, skylarks, it just excites me and makes it worth my while that I am doing something right on my farm. And these are skylarks eggs. Um, you know, they're currently under threat from crows. A lot of crows seem to be uh, hovering about where they're nesting at the moment, especially in late spring. Um, this particular chick was um, being attacked by a crow, so I think that helped save it. And that's the one and only time I managed to find uh, a skylark nest with eggs in it. Finding the sweet spot between biodiversity and productivity is the key. Um, you know, as farmers, we tend to be just production driven, but I think working with nature and looking after the environment and producing good quality food and looking after animal, animal welfare is key. And hopefully policy will sort of be driven in the right direction. Nature-friendly livestock farmers can be the next generation pharmaceutical. Um, I pinched this quote from somebody else, but I quite like it. Um, you know, pharmaceutical companies seem to be dictating everything in the world. So maybe us as farmers, we can be the farm, proper pharmaceutical. Policymakers engagement. Um, talk to your MPs, assembly members, invite them to your farm, lobby government, make contact with civil servants, get them out on farm, connect with NGOs, join Nature Friendly Farming Network, which I'm on the Wales Leadership Group, uh, steering group, um, get the public on the farmer side, promote what great things livestock farmers 
uh, farming does. Graze, grazing livestock is part of a solution, not the problem. You know, we can't emphasize this is enough. It's quite scary what some policymakers are talking about. Um, next generation sheep farmers. And this is something that really concerns me. I think the current BPS system prevents farm young farmers getting on the ladder, old pension farmers cling clinging on to land, C city investors and corporations are the new enemy. Tax evasion avoidance, or tax rules as some call it, encourages the wealthy. Unless young farmers get some help soon, what will the appliance look like in 10 years? Government need to act now and ensure the next generation farmers will be looked after. Rural areas with just a handful of wealthy land donors isn't good for communities. Anyway, thank you very much. That's all from me for now. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hal. Uh, great advocate for upland livestock farming. And uh, we're going to pass over to Davey while he's setting things up. You know, Zoom is a uh, it doesn't answer all of society's ills, does it? But it does allow us on a on a Wednesday morning to 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 zip quickly from Suffolk right over to the Brecon Beacons, and now we're on our way up to uh, Scotland, just south of um, Glasgow, I think, where Davy is. Uh, Davy has um, been involved in uh, a lot of research around uh, farming, land management, and uh, and biodiversity, and um, he comes more from a, a research um, perspective than our previous two speakers. But Davy, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Phil, and thanks for the opportunity to speak this morning. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen okay? Yes, it looks fine. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, morning, folks. So uh, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what we're doing um, at um, from a biodiversity perspective at our um, upland research and demonstration farms in the Southern Highlands, just um, um, north of uh, Loch Lomond. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail um, on this map. Uh, or, the, or the text on this map, you can um, look at the slides um, after the event. The key thing to take from this is just we're 2,200 hectares in size. Um, we have only about 50 hectares of good quality pasture. That's the yellow down in the bottom left, at bottom right hand side. Um, and we've got another um, 170 hectares of semi improved pasture. That's the orange, um, again, down in the bottom um, left of the, the picture itself. Then the bulk of the rest of the um, farm is um, moorland uh, and a moorland that goes from 172 me 170 metres at the bottom of the farm to over a thousand metres at the top of the farm. So it's quite an extensive challenging actual farm. We've talked a lot about climate change this morning. Um, these are what's called warming stripes or basically average annual temperatures in, in my part of Scotland from 1890 through to about 2018. Um, the red sh red colour showing where the average temperature was greater um, in, th in that particular year than the 25 year average. So you can see quite clearly that temperature um, um, has been increasing over the last 20, 30 years. We do a lot of work on the farm in terms of how you can actually um, change, improve land management and, and agricultural management practices um, to actually mitigate uh, against sort of climate change but the purpose of this slide is just to emphasize that even by doing that that's only get, going to get us so far down the road of the scale of change that we actually need um, if we're going to get to net zero emissions um, by 2045. Um, in order to achieve those net zero we need to have much more in the way of sort of um, uh, environmental management whether it's biodiversity management, flood mitigation, peatland restoration, woodland creation to actually allow us to actually get to that point in time. We started out about 25 years ago, looking at the biodiversity um, on the farm uh, and actually focused um, on the lower part of the farm. Um, the uplands, the moorland um, extent um, is um, relatively species diverse in some parts of the, of, of the uplands, but it was down in the lower part of the farm where we were more doing more intensive management that we realised there wasn't that much from biodiversity. We started off 25 years ago, basically looking at a small, small number of parts um, of the lower part of the farm where and on the left hand side there, we did an area of wetland that was being grazed. We stopped the grazing and have continued to stop the grazing and just allowed the sort of the, the, the tall herbs and the um, and vegetation to actually develop. We've got a nice little wetland area there now. And even doing something um, as simple as actually allowing um, gorse to actually establish and, 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 and flower. Um, it can actually be good for insects and a, and a wide range of bird species, both nesting habitat and, and feeding habitat. 
Um, and if I could get this to show, uh, one of the major things we've done in the uh, the lower part of the farm is just fence off. We've got a number of small burns run through the bottom of the farm, just fence off the field margins on either side, um, and allow the actual um, vegetation to um, um, grow to its, its its natural extent. So we haven't planted these field margins at all. We just, we just reduced the grazing pressure, and that's allowed the vegetation to come up each summer. Um, it's uh, very species rich, it's good for vegetation, but it's also good for um, a wide range of invertebrates, and it's also good range uh, for a wide range of, sort of birds. So we, we regularly see our swallows, our house martins, um, our, our barn owls, and even bats feeding over the insect rich in field margins. And we also, on the right hand side there, um, we have a small population of black um, highland water voles particularly like the margins and on the farm. And again, um, we uh, are in the Southern Highlands. We get between two and a half and three and a half metres of rain each year. But until six years ago, we had no standing water on the farm. And so again, we identified a couple, two um, um, parts of the farm that we weren't sort of utilising in a major way. Um, and we created what's called wader scrapes, basically shallow wetlands there. They're primarily designed to actually benefit um, birds like lapwing or curlew, uh, but certainly in our part of the world, a, a greater number of farmers would need to be doing this sort of management to actually get um, those um, birds back. But it certainly has benefited birds like snipe and oyster catcher, and definitely benefited a wide range of invertebrates like um, a, a number of these um, dragonflies. Um, 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 illustrated here. And this is just a map of the, uh, of the lower part of the farm where the majority, um, not all, but the majority of the in-by fields are. Most of our management has been in and around the, uh, uh, the margins of the actual fields themselves. Uh, we have established, uh, if you see the picture um, on the, uh, the, the left picture. You can see we've got a large shelter belt in the background there. Those are due for overdue for actually um, harvesting and replanting. So we put in a few, a uh, couple of additional shelter belts um, into the in by fields. Um, and um, we've also been doing a bit of planting um, using some funding from our, we sit within the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park in order to actually um, uh, allow some more succession um, of um, trees which are occurring within our uh, pastures. I, I'm not able to uh, uh, regenerate naturally because of the sort of the grazing um, within them. We've done um, a lot of biodiversity management on the lower part of the farm. Um, and I would say uh, well, the majority, if not all of that biodiversity management, it hasn't detracted from any of the management of the farm on the farm, that part of the farm at all. Certainly been no adverse impact and certainly integrating a greater range of trees into that lower part of the farm, even though we're very wet. The last three, four summers has been very dry um, and having, having more shelter down in that part of the farm is going to be beneficial um, for the farm and for the livestock and um, through into the in, in the years to come, given climate change. Uh, out on the, uh, the extent of the, uh, uh, the moorlands, and we have a moorland management plan um, that uh, uh, combines our sheep grazing and the summer grazing of, of cattle out there. Um, and that's particularly designed to actually help. Uh, we've got a small population of black grouse um, back on the back on the moorlands, and they're quite rare in Scotland. They've been declining in Scotland, they're certainly quite rare in our part of Stirlingshire. Um, so everything that I've talked about to date, we've been integrating in and around the farm management practices, just to actually say that uh, 20 odd years ago, we did um, and plant a significant amount of woodland, um, over 200 hectares of woodland um, in one of our highland glens, and um, that's the montane woodland um, on the picture on the right hand side. Uh, and um, that has taken out uh, uh, land for agricultural production. We do intend to put um, livestock back in there, um, but just not yet because the trees, although they've established, have not really really established to a height that we can put livestock back in there without actually um, destroying the, the trees itself. In this lower ridge, lower glen, um, sorry, glen leading up to um, 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 that highland glen, we also planted um, woodland in there that's established very well. Uh, that was an area of the farm that was extraordinarily difficult for our sh um, shepherds to sort of gather the sheep out of because the sheep kept coming back, etc. And then it was difficult to find and locate them. So actually planting that area of the farm has actually been beneficial um, to the actual farm management um, itself. Uh, the map on the left hand side, the purple areas are where um, peat occurs in Scotland. We've got about 2 million hectares of peatland in Scotland. Much of it, 70% of it is degraded. 
Um, and so Scottish Government have a big focus on um, restoring peatlands. We've restored about 100 hectares of peatland on the farm through funding from um, Scottish Government and, and, and Nature Scott, doing a variety of things like reprofiling open hags and um, trying to um, create um, standing water to allow sphagnum to um, grow and regenerate um, in peat gullies um, and re-wetting um, areas of sort of bare peat. So that's been quite a, a, a run through, just some example of what we're doing. Um, when you see the slides or get access to the slides after the event, there's a number of links there that go into a wee bit more detail about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and especially what we've actually found from it. So I just want to say thank you very much to all the funders as, as usual. And that was it, because I'm just conscious, Phil, I would want to make sure we've got time left for questions. You're muted, Phil. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, another screen popped up, but uh, yeah, no, thank you very much, David. That 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 was great. And um, you know, although you've touched on one or two areas that where, where you're taking land out of production, I think generally all three speakers have talked um, quite eloquently about how um, you um, integrate productivity alongside um, the protection of natural resources and measures to improve uh, wildlife and biodiversity. Um, so now it was really great. So we've got quite a few uh, questions that have come in. I'm going to deal with one or two that have come up in, in the chat, first of all. Um, and there was one that came in early on from um, Mike Gooding that I think you may have answered, John, but it was a question to you, John. How do you measure biodiversity? It's often referenced in international science, but what is the right um, measure to demonstrate progress? Sarah Benyon would say just count dung beetles, I guess as a proxy, but how do you how would you quantify improvement? Well, um, uh, we have a relationship with the Suffolk Wildlife Trust and uh, we um, get them to do surveys on the farm. And so, um, you know, we, we've got, I've got a whole list of the different things that we surveyed from ponds to dragonflies to, as you, you saw the ones that we put up on the screen, but also rare arable plants. And, and so what we do is we have a rolling five year rotation on those surveys. So uh, five years ago, we did a bird survey. This year, we've done another winter and breeding bird survey. And so the progress, as far as we're concerned, is very much on a local level. As far as we're concerned, we're just looking at the numbers as they come in, as we have this rolling program of surveys. Um, as far as what I'm going to do with it and what we uh, are able to do with it, I think that what we can do is because we know we're doing certain things on the farm that are affecting uh, wildlife, um, mostly in a positive direction. But when we're looking at uh, the new ELM scheme coming in, in and certainly the more competitive elements in it in the top two tiers, is that I think it's going to be very, um, and when you're sort of bidding for that, that, that sort of um, element of the new scheme, I think it's very important to understand where you are and where you want to go and the kind of things you need to do. So as far as putting in success, successful bid and I really want to fully engage with it um, I think having that data is really really important. Mm. Yeah thank you I know of several people that are using uh, wildlife trusts and uh, you know, county bird um, uh, officers to, uh, to to do camps like that but uh, there are options for people I guess I think uh, that deals. Uh, yeah can I say I mean Hill made a really <laughs> important point in his talk which was actually engaging with the NGOs and rather than mm. fighting them you know we need to be engaging with them it's so important. Yeah, great, thanks. That deals with uh, Graham and Travis's question as well, I think. Um, there was a question from Julia Aglianby um, to you, Howell, about what height um, do you find optimum to graze your herbal lays and, and pasture to optimise lamb growth? So at what stage are you turning them in and, uh, and grazing them? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I think with, with cattle, it's very easier, but with lambs, you just want the, you know, the quality there rather than um, the stockies <coughs> raise up damage the feet. So I tend to put them in like something like an eight inch cover sort of thing, seven to eight inch, and pull them out. Um, I do try to rotate my bunches of lambs so they have a variety of um, grass because um, I did once keep my lambs in, on herbalize a bit too long and I lost a bit of them for, from bloat. And um, so you've got to be careful there. But um, so make sure where you leave enough left, um, something like a two, two, three inch left when you take them out sort of in. So turn them in about eight inches of cover and uh, bring them out about three inches in there. And they soon grows back subject to whatever conditions. Um, but I find the key that you just, just move them to a different field at least once a week. Don't let them be there for too long. Um, it's not always possible. In spring, we struggle 
uh, with grass growth sort of thing, um, especially with the East India. So, you know, horses for courses a bit, but yeah, just in the summertime, just eight inches in and then sort of three inches out. Great, thanks, Al. Okay, I'm going to move on to some of the Q and A's now. Move away from the the, the comments in chat. And uh, there's a, an interesting um, question from uh, an anonymous attendee: Living on a, a sheep farm myself, with many heritage aspects, including ridge and furrow grassland, how do you see heritage working alongside sheep farmers um, going forward when grass and soil quality may be decreasing uh, due to restrictions and that's there's an interesting question behind that as well because i think for a long time um a lot of our agro-environment programs i guess have been based on on weakening for soil fertility on the basis that it incre in increases plant diversity but you know i think you've all given some interesting pictures and some of the the most biodiverse farms i've seen would be really intensive farms not intensive in terms of their inputs but intensive in terms of the the activity that's going on on those farms and uh, uh, again, Howell, I think you said it, that um, it's, some of this is about identifying the sweet spot between optimising um, productivity and, uh, and nature and, and sometimes weakening um, you know, for soil fertility. Um, it, it doesn't do that necessarily. I think there is a sweet spot, but there's an interesting question. So who would like to comment on, on, on that? Um, John, John, can I start with you? So it's really about... Um, um, yeah, go on. Well, no, I mean, I, it, it's, it, I think that for us in, in the sort of arable East, um, as far as heritage is concerned, uh, answering that question, um, is that, of course, you know, uh, you know, the, all the churches around us, all the wool towns uh, were built on the back of the wool trade. So as far as heritage is concerned, we've just got to get people to boom and well, well wear the stuff. You know, uh, that would be a good start. Uh, and I think we need to look back to our heritage as far as wool is concerned. Uh, and that's, you know, I know that's slightly off to a tangent, but, you know, for goodness sake, they've got this amazing product that, uh, and, and, and the ridiculousness that we call something made out of petrol chemicals of fleece, for Christ's sake. Mm. Um, uh, as far as fertility uh, and, and, and uh, improving soils is concerned, um, uh, you know, because there's the other side of it, actually, is that thinner soils actually produce actually a greater range of rare arable plants. And we do have some areas on the farm where it is, there's not, as, and we want to leave those as they are to encourage those species. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned is that the lays and the sheep coming back onto the farm has brought a huge amount of diversity, which I hope I demonstrated uh, within the sort of sections on the pollinators and the butterflies and the birds. Um, so I'm not sure if I've really answered the question, but having uh, sheep back on the farm and improving soil fertility, I think the offshoot of that is to uh, bring a huge amount of biodiversity back into an arable landscape. And that's the key point is that we are, we have been denuding our, um, uh, you know, our farms of nature over a long period of time and uh, having animals and lays back in the system is helping reverse that. Mm. Thanks, John. And then um, going to David then. So in an upland situation, uh, uh, you know, again, there are, uh, you know, a lot of our common upland areas would be uh, sites of special scientific interest with uh, big restrictions on them. You talk quite a lot about um, uh, regenerating uh, peatland and uh, re-wetting peatland. And a lot of people would say there's a, a conflict there between land management and trying to, you know, optimise productivity. But um it's about getting this plant right, surely, isn't it? Have you got any comments you'd like to make on, on that question? Uh, yes, um, two. So going back to the lowland part of the farm, though that 50 hectares of in-by grassland that I talked about, um, until we started back in 2013 um, and doing much more regular soil sampling and then actively liming, etc., on, on parts of the farm, um, our pH was low uh, in, in, in those fields. But also because we were the way we were actually managing those fields, that you know that low pH doesn't automatically benefit grass, mm. uh, benefit a wider range of plant species if it's being sort of grazed out. Um, and it also depends on what your biodiversity focus is. Um, um, I've examined a PhD earlier this um, summer, where um, looking at um, foraging birds and birds foraging on earthworms and other insects in the soil, the vast majority of them don't like. Um, um, low pHs, they need reasonable pHs, uh, and so you know you can actually um, by by actually improving your grassland management on that part of the farm, um, we're not only making that part of the farm more productive, but we're managing it less intensively. Uh, well, sorry, 
we're managing intensively in terms of managing the actual grasslands so that we actually um, are, are, are managing the grassland resource a lot better than we did um, in the past. Um, but we're also looking to see how what, what benefit that will actually have on the soil invertebrates and sort of foraging birds. We get a lot of golden plover um, passing through the farm with 40 feeding in our and by fields at night earlier in the spring um, that we wouldn't have known about had had, had our um, game manager not actually had night vision goggles um, on it. The upper part of the farm actually it's that's where there's it's where a balance is needed but where it's even more difficult to achieve that balance on the high high hills that we actually have uh, they are actually unusually for for scotland and very species grassland uh, sorry plant species rich um, but it's actually been able to achieve the right level of grazing we know that reducing the grazing in those areas ain't good for the ain't good for the vegetation but then the difficulty is how do you actually get the right um, um grazing intensity in an area where you're talking maybe about a, a, I don't know, 200, 200 300 hectare grazing block. Um, so, the, you know, it's it, I haven't got all the answers, but um, mm. but, but certainly um, it, it is about uh, getting the grazing intensity and particularly the grazing timing right in many of these areas, rather than taking grazing out altogether. And in your view, how important would um, uh, native breeds and, and those really traditional hefted sea, uh, systems be in trying to uh, achieve the optimum level of grazing patterns? How important is that? Uh, well, I, again, how they are managed and when they're put out is also just as important. Um, and we're using, well, it was Aberdeen Angus, it's now Aberdeen Angus Shorthorn Cross um, cattle um, um, out there, uh, out, out in our hill. Um, and hopefully they are making a benefit. It's just we've got uh, only a small number of them grazing a large area, and it's difficult to actually focus focus in on that. But yeah, certainly grazing uh, um, uh, livestock that are actually more attuned to the climatic conditions and able to actually um, um, make um, optimal use of the vegetation uh, will certainly uh, give you a more uh, chance and more opportunities to ensure you can actually get some decent um, livestock production as well. Is actually managed so that the vegetation well. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. There's a comment here from uh, Charlotte Desborough. Um, how should we be communicating new agri environment schemes uh, to show that food and livestock production and nature can go hand in hand? Um, again, I, I mean, I guess it is it's a really interesting question because for a long time, you know, we talked about um, uh, agri environment as being quite separate in many cases to um, to farming practices, but maybe the new way forward is about much greater integration and a systems-based approach. So, you know, what, what can we, what more can we do? How will you, um, you know, you talked a little bit about that in terms of your interaction with, with the public, but is there a new way? Uh, we need to change the dialogue. Is there a new way of communicating our agri-environment schemes to integrate product productivity? Yeah, yeah, I 100%. We, we need to make sure that uh, grazing livestock is part of a solution, not a problem because you know, too much emphasis is put in on um, livestock grazing, especially the cattle, how bad they are for the planet. But you know, I think we have systems around the world with um, special cattle um, production that are, is probably the worst for the planet than we like to think. But yeah, you know, we need to communicate with these po uh, policy makers and even the public, Joe public in the streets and explain you know, that cattle and sheep raising, you know, red meat production on grasslands is part of a solution and, you know, it, it, they're working together sort of. Thing. So, you know, my curly was a comeback on a hill, I think, because of a cattle just grazing a bit harder sort of thing in certain areas, not everywhere, you know, there's only a, there is only a small number of cattle there. Um, so we need to manage areas slightly different to get different results. But we need all the tools in a box. You take livestock grazing off these hills, all of a sudden, what we got is this rank millennia, which is a, you know, it's a disaster for fire. Mm. So I think even if we just use the sheep and the cattle as a grazing tool to manage, uh, to stop prevent fire, wildfires, I think you know, that, that alone justifies having um, livestock on these hills to me, just mm. for if you're producing protein and if you're encouraging biodiversity, that's just watching some birds, you know, peck away at cow muck on the hills. It's, it's just fascinating sort of thing, isn't it? You know? uh, mm. And I think pe these people, a lot, lot of these people have complained. They never set foot off a 
tarmac road that joins the common or the hill or the farm. They just walk about 100 metres and they, they'll see something. And it's, oh, that's generalised, isn't it? Mm. Right to the middle of these common lands. And this is a totally different world sort of thing. Mm. A tough one, but I think as I do with my uh, selling direct, I'm talking direct to the consumer. Um, not many farmers can say they know who actually eats their meat. You know, I sell people the meat. I know who they are. I know where they live, sort of thing. I, I get feedback back. You know, this is great. This is fantastic. Um, occasionally, you know, I wasn't happy with that, sort of thing. So you try and tweak what I did wrong, sort of thing, isn't it? Mm. So engagement. And I think farmers have been not proactive enough discussing and talking to our consumers. And, you know, it's usually like for city people and the country people. We, we mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, th thanks, Hall. D John, to you, um, you know, I've spoken to many sheep farmers just over the last um, six months or so who, um, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed a period of very high sheep prices, you know, almost, um, you know, prices that have been unknown previously. And there's lots of people that um, are juggling to think about whether they, they want to, um, in a way, turn away from agri-environment schemes and just go for productivity, thinking that they might be able to be viable purely on, on, on production. Um, there's a lot of people now that are questioning and, and this, this um, issue of um, integration so that we do try to encourage product, pr productive agriculture to also be delivering um, environmental um, goods and to link with agri-environment schemes is going to be important for our reputation as much as financial viability, isn't it? But um, you know, again, have you, have you got any views on that subject? Um, well, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, most farmers that I know are equally interested in the environment as they are in uh, producing food uh, on their farms. And I am a great believer that both things can happen uh, hand in hand. Uh, and and, and, I, and I, again, you know, um, you know, we're organic because, you know, we, we use it as a, a marketing tool, but it, can, it, it doesn't have to be organic. It can be anything. It's about telling your story. Mm. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned uh, and, and about the sort of the new schemes that are coming along, I really want to fully engage with them because it's something that I really enjoy. It's something that actually puts the cream on top of uh, what we're doing as far as uh, managing uh, land in the countryside. And I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, we're going to fully engage with that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and also equally, um, people who don't want to engage and see no value in uh, past schemes, but also the new schemes coming along, will be free to do um, whatever they want to do. They can opt out. Mm. Um, and actually, that's what's really interesting about, you know, farms in this country is that we all have different ways of looking at things. And actually, at the end of the day, um, that brings uh, a huge amount of diversity, but also knowledge. So, you know, I th I'm all for pe lots of people doing lots of different things and actually all us all learning from each other. Mm, yeah, no, I would agree. There's a couple of uh, comments from an anonymous attendee. It could well be the same person, but um, I, I'm not disagreeing with a lot of what's being said. But why should we do this for climate reasons? Just one plane journey will undo one farm's efforts for a considerable amount of time. Agriculture is not the answer for this one, and he's probably. And, and then there's also a comment about the uh, the, the the untidy uh, aspect of. Uh, of uh, music festivals and the, the aftermath of plastic and tents and rubbish that is left behind. And we can't, you know, we can't resolve all the world's issues, can we? But this is surely about the, the contribution that we can make and our reputation as well as being a, a, an economic benefit to us. Davey, if, would you like to comment on that subject? Uh, yes, um, and, and, and certainly, as you say, I, I don't have any comment on the littering type side of things. That's a, that's a behavioural change that, that we can't influence. Um, but I think it's important, I mean, a, a lot of what we've talked about this morning, uh, the nature of the biodiversity benefits of what we've, we've done in our respective three farms, um, there's a danger because I've, I've, I've seen this a lot, that um, farmers, other land managers, see that as only benefiting a wider society. And we need to ensure that um, many, if not all, land managers recognise that actually some of the changes that they um, will be asked to make or could make on their farms, yes, will benefit biodiversity, yes, will benefit sort of climate change and mitigation, but actually will benefit their farms themselves. Um, so I, I think I mentioned... Um, and, you know, we're integrating trees more in the lower part of the farm 
uh, particularly around the boundaries, um, but we're keen to put more trees in, in within the fields as well, because we've certainly seen um, a lot more in the way of sort of, well, we haven't seen droughts in our part of the world, but certainly much, much drier and warmer in springs and summers and autumns, and we need much more in the way of shelter, <laughs> um, both for both for um, um, those um, um, adverse conditions now occurring more in the summer, but also um, extreme weather events in the winter. So. I would strongly encourage farmers and land managers to look at what they could do on the farm and actually see what benefit they actually get from the farming system point of view. Managing, we, we talked about soil fertility earlier on and, 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 and different sort of um, and practices with regard to sort of uh, uh, clover and cropping. They all have a benefit to the actual soil health and the ultimate sustainability of the farm. So we need to, stop, we need to try and get away from this divide that nature management is for somebody else and farm management is for me. Actually, you know, it can benefit the farm as much as the wider society. Mm. Just to touch between the three of you, just to touch on something you just said there, David, too, because I've often thought, I may be wrong, but I've often thought that, you know, when we're trying to rebuild nature, it's probably right that it's the same approach as when you build a house, you get the foundations right first. And uh, the foundation, in my mind, is often soil. Uh, it's about soil life, biological life in and around the soil. And from that, um, other things can build. Again, would you agree with that, um, John? I agree with it as far as uh, the farming bit of our business is concerned. Um, but as far as the, uh, if you're looking at, you know, an ancient woodland on our farm, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's best just left alone. And uh, so I think it's, it's a mixture between on the production parts of the farm, you know, having clover, building soil fertility, being able to uh, farm without, uh, uh, with less pesticides and less fertilizers uh, is key. So it has its role to play, yeah. Thanks, and how? Yeah, 100%. So um, I'll just read in the comments as well. Um, somebody just asked about the um, receding sort of thing. Um, I, I think as farmers, we recede too much. Um, we've got this um, perennial ripe grass, self-seeding uh, grass sort of thing. And we tend to kill it off and want to um, buy new seeds. Uh, I think the only one that truly benefits is the seed company sort of thing. It just let's, mm. Let's build soil health with um, correct, well managed livestock grazing. Um, we don't need fertilizers, sort of thing, or chemicals. To know, to know, it's, we've, we're grassland farmers, sort of thing, you know. Mm. Uh, and I, yeah, thanks. And David, I guess my comment was probably targeted more towards lowland farm soil management more than upland. But again, how important is soil and soil life as a foundation for biodiversity? It, well, well, soil and soil life is, is, is important as a foundation for biodiversity, no matter where you are. So these species rich um, um, upland grasslands that I was talking about is actually the, the soil conditions that are actually driving that. But mm. going back to your original question, you, you actually helped answer the question in your question, Phil. You said, I wanted to build a house and I would get the foundations right. Simply saying we want to improve nature. And so, so you knew what the target was. You, you wanted to have a house, ultimately. Saying on any farm, I want to improve nature, is too broad a question. You need to be clearer about what do I want to actually achieve here? Is it vegetation? Is it birds? Is it invertebrates? Where on the farm it is? What scale, that, what scale does that need to be? And then that drives what foundations you need to actually put in. Mm. And as you say, that does, that does require um, you know, some thinking and some planning and some careful consideration. Um, yep. That, absolutely. No. OK, I want to turn to a couple of um, really practical questions from someone I know is a very practical chap, Kevin Harrison, um, who farms not very far away from me in, in, in Bath, just outside of Bath. Um, Kevin's asking, um, what are the main animal health issues that occur through grazing shabby lays? So, again, you know, whether we were right to call this uh, shabby, is shabby the new chic or not? I don't know, really. But, you know, I guess how we'll just touch on it now. And uh, you said that we're very quick to reseed our lays. You know, if you look at the way that uh, grass breeding has gone over the last 50 or 60 years, is led to some very tidy grassland fields. You know, there is a case possibly for going back to uh, more diverse, um, well, uh, yeah, not possibly, there is a case for going back to more diverse lays and maybe not managing our grassland so intensively. But there are also potentially some sheep health issues that can. Um, that, that it can come about and that probably will be in in uh, some of our lowland grasses through grass quality and some of our upland pastures as well. I mean a lot of people talk about liver fluke, um, the dangers of uh, liver fluke um, when re-wetting um, grassland areas. Um, how come to you, you know, what are the main, are, are, do, do you see any health issues that occur through grazing the farm in the way you do? 
Yeah, definitely. There are health issues and they're all good health issues sort of thing. So, you know, the, the, the rye grass has only got a short taproot sort of thing. It doesn't go searching for no nutrients, no minerals. These longer sort of well, more established grasslands sort of thing, they got deeper root in. So they actually go and hunting for trace elements and passing on to animals. So now, to, to be honest, the, the people that use a lot of rye grasses, they tend to buy the minerals and the good stuff in, in a bag or in a lorry afterwards sort of thing, or buy it in a drench. So now, if you see an animal enough looking well, he's always got a, stuck, a head stuck in a fence looking for something in a hedge. That mm -hmm. head hasn't been changed for you forever, probably. And that's where the, the sick lamb always gets, wants to be sort of thing, isn't it? So I think, yeah. Sort of, mm. I mean, you picked up on a, a health uh, benefit from um, uh, from grazing uh, unconventional layers, yeah. I guess. Um, John, come to you. So with your New Zealand Romneys, um, are you, uh, you know, are, what, what are you seeing there with grazing? Again, you'd be grazing in very unconventional ways in terms of uh, the time when you uh, you would graze, I guess. You seeing any um, health issues? Possibly, but I think Hal's made a really important point about actually what you actually put in your layers, because uh, what we're wanting to do uh, is to bring up as many minerals and as much diverse stuff from within the soil that we're bu building uh, fertility into to be able to feed our sheep. And so we're putting in, you know, chicory and rib grass, but different grass species, but also lots of different clover species, certainly in the dry east where we sometimes suffer from droughts. Uh, as we're using more sand foin and we're using more lucerne and that's about getting roots down for moisture but they're also building uh, bringing up um, lots of nutrients but as far as the health of our flock is concerned is we're in an ideal situation where we're rotating them around the farm and so they let the, the farm has complete break for sh from sheep for four years and so uh, you know that's obviously an advantage for a low grazing rotational system uh, but uh, as Hal said you know it's incredibly important to get all those diverse species in there uh, to help your sheep, uh, you know, effectively medicate themselves. Great. And, and Davey? Uh, yeah, so you mentioned in the question concerns about re-wetting and liver fluke and, and the two wader scrapes that we created on the farm, on the lowland part of the farm. You know, other other farmers um, would look at that and say, well, actually, you're just creating much more of a sort of a liver fluke risk. Um, in our situation, um, we weren't concerned about that. We knew we had a liver fluke problem on the farm. We knew uh, because the, 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 the snail that acts as a liver fluke host doesn't occur in our upland, you know, the upland grazing areas just because the pH is so low. Um, but nevertheless, we've been working since um, we established those two wader scrapes. We've been working closely with colleagues at the Borden Research Institute. Um, and Philip Scoose and his colleagues have been coming and monitoring both our wader scrapes and the in by fields around it um, and although we have no standing water until we created um, those wader scrapes uh, the, 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 the rainfall um, was enough that the wet soils in and around the in by fields that we were having to graze anyway that was where our biggest um, liver fluke risk is um, and was and still is um, um, unless things have changed they, they just visited two weeks ago and I haven't caught up with them since then but up until two weeks ago six years of monitoring in and around the wader scrapes hasn't shown any um, um, liver fluke incidents. Even though we are grazing those areas lightly during the summer, that's part of the agri-environment conditions for it, but we, we just choose carefully what animals we put in there during that time and, and, and how they've been previously treated. Um, and, and just to actually try and mitigate any risk. But at the moment, Touchwood, there's no additional risk associated with those. Mm. But Philip would also say that, that that's, and I think somebody's mentioned it in the chat, every farm is different. Going back to actually, well, where would you want to create that wetland area? And would it, should it potentially increase liver fluke risk within the wetland area or any of the areas around it? It's just an, a, an, an obvious question to uh, consider when you're putting in place the foundations for your outcomes. Mm. And just touching on the issue of um, of, of grass and, and nutrition as well, um, you know, for a number of years now, uh, we've talked about um, the benefits of mob, mob graze and certainly in terms of building um, soil organic matter. And there's always been some real question marks about how suitable sheep are for mob grazing. Um, yeah, we've always traditionally grazed them on really short pastures and and allowed that grass just to come back again and graze them, you know, when it's four or five centimetres high or whatever. But again, John, you showed some photographs of uh, sheep growing in quite dense and tall and biomass. Um, and we are seeing now more talk about sheep being part of regenerative uh, farming and grazing systems. So have anyone got any comments about uh, sheep and uh, 
nutrition and, and different approaches to grazing? I'll start with you, you John, because uh, I think you covered it in one or two of your photographs. Well, yeah, I have to say that I, I don't come from a sheep farming background, so I, there's no received wisdom as far as I'm concerned. We just stock them in, you know, if we've got something that is just... Uh, you know, incredibly high. The only thing we do do, obviously, is we give them very small space to start off and fill themselves up, and then we release them into the field. But as far as mob grazing on, especially particularly on cover crops, but on uh, lays that have probably have been have have you know we should have been on them a bit quicker with sheep. I, you know, they've just done fantastically. I think you know mob grazing with sheep is um, is something that we've never really thought we shouldn't be doing. We've just done it, and it's worked incredibly well. So um, and especially on cover crops over the winter as well. Mm. Thanks, and how? Yeah, mob grazing definitely works. Uh, my only concern is, um, don't know. I think sheep will do better than lambs when you want to finish them off. I think those lambs need um, a bit more space, perhaps. But or you have to move them quite regular, maybe at least every two days, sort of thing. Um, it's a fine balance between looking after the grasses and the soils and looking after that animal. Let's mm. get it balance right is 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 key and we're not always going to get it right and if we make mistakes let's not worry too much about it sort of thing let's learn from our mistakes and let's try something different i think and just if, just watch the animals see how they respond and how what they prefer but you know learn from our mistakes just don't be scared to try something different mm -hmm. I, mean, I think as several people have said you know that diversity we've got across agriculture in the UK is uh, something to be really proud of. It's something that's uh, a really rich diversity. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't want everything to be homogenous, would we really? So uh, I'm aware of the time and the uh, time is moving on. I just want to ask, there was a, a, a point that came through from Charlotte, which uh, Charlotte Desborough, which again is a, a good question really in terms of thinking about the future, but with all the good work you were doing on your farms, and I'll go around each of you individually, what do you hope to see more of in the future? So just a very short, succinct answer really what would you like to see more of or do more of in the future john as far as i'm concerned i want to see um our farm as far as the environmental bits of the farm is, is concerned is to be more diverse um i would also i've got a slight ambition to um have a proper mixed farming system and have some cattle on the farm uh but i really see them sort of being integrated with those sort of new schemes and using opportunities in the new schemes to uh, sort of take this thing on and, um, you know, have a more uh, increasingly diverse business and farm as far as nature is concerned. Great. Thanks, John. And how? Yeah, a um, bit controversial on a sheep um, uh, webinar, perhaps, but I would like to see much more cattle in the uplands, which in turn would give bring benefits with it, sort of thing, not just for sheep, but biodiversity, wildlife. Um, bit more birds sort of thing. I love seeing the curlews. I wish I could see uh, more curlews up there sort of thing, more golden plovers and hen harriers even. Just just variety of um, birds and wildlife that gives us good sign that we are winning sort of thing. Great. Thanks, Howell. And Davey? The key thing we're looking at at the minute is getting more um, woodland onto the lower part of the farm, not into those in-by fields, but to some of those semi-improved areas. Um, um, but particularly um, uh, woodland that will be an economic benefit to the farm in the future and to try and show how you can really, uh, around, and you can't see it from the picture very well, but around where we are, there's, there's lots of productive conifer forests that have been planted over the last 40 years. We don't need to show that Sitka spruce grows in our type of land because it does, but we're more interested in can we identify areas of, or well, we have identified areas of the farm where we'd like to put in more um, hardwood, uh, with hardwood that would have an, an economic benefit to the farm, obviously out with my lifetime, but show that actually we can put more woodland into, integrate it into a health farm such as us without actually um, adversely impacting agricultural production and benefiting the wider resilience, economic as well as environmental of the farm. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there was a comment that came through from Dan Phipps. Now, Dan Phipps is our national chairman. I would be doing a real disservice if I didn't uh, read this one out. It's not really a question, but it's a good summary comment, I think. Um, uh, we have mostly become very efficient at keeping our land man managed agriculturally for production. And now, as a result, uh, increasingly need to turn our attention to biodiversity. Um, Phil alluded to in his introduction that in the past, there seemed to be 
effectively derelict farms that would have been a haven for wildlife. This would range from owls in empty barns to insects on untreated meadows. This is what we would think of as being shabby, but land has become uh, valuable, too valuable to neglect generally, and we have to feed an ever-growing population. You, as, um, as uh, presenters, are showing the way forward to produce food whilst caring for the environment um, it, it's produced within, which I think is a good summary. You know, I think you know, you are, you're, you're all involved with, uh, well, productive and research farms that are trying to, uh, as Howell said, hit that sweet spot between um, optimizing productivity and um, protecting natural resources um, and looking after nature and, and, and biodiversity. And all of that, of course, is tangled up with um, carbon and, and climate friendly farming. So um, it is, it's quarter to 10. So I think we ought to finish, but I think it's been a really uh, a really um, interesting and uh, inspirational hour and a quarter. And I'd just like to thank the three of you very, very much for participating. Um, we've had um, some questions, plenty of questions. We've had some questions that we've not managed to answer. Um, and I think we will get back to um, all of the people that um, uh, raise those questions and we'll provide answers. Um, and I'd also just like to say that on the 6th of October, we're doing these NSA Breakfast Club webinars now on a monthly basis. On the 6th of October is our next one, Wednesday morning. And um, again, it's within that, it's connected to that whole uh, theme of countdown to COP. But we want to raise something that we think is being uh, not adequately considered at the moment about people and communities. And um, our, the, 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 um, the title of the, the webinar is going to be Forgotten Faces, Recognising Rural Culture and Rural Communities Within the Climate or Alongside the Climate Debate. So we just want to make sure that with all this focus on, on carbon and the climate, which is absolutely crucial, that we don't stop looking as holistically as we possibly can. Today we've looked at nature. In a month's time, we're going to start looking at uh, rural communities and some other people, which definitely shouldn't be forgotten. So I'd like to thank you uh, very, very much for uh, participating and thank uh, everyone that's joined us. We had a really good attendance this morning. Uh, thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day. And um, yeah, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks. Oh.